Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Wet Wintelec webinars. I'm Blaze Stewart. Today, I'll be talking about how to build Docker files and tips and tricks as it relates to that. Um, if you have some questions, we'll pose those questions in the Q&A section. There's a there's a little app for that that you can pose a question and we'll answer those at the end in our Q&A time. And uh, we will we're post we will be posting this video online. That's a common question we get. We will we'll be posting this video online later for you to review. So uh, if you don't get a chance to if you have to step out for some reason, we'll put it on our YouTube channel and you can check it out there uh, as soon as we get a chance to post that. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and jump in and talk a little bit about when Select and who we are and what we do. And uh, then we'll go right into tips and tricks with Docker files. So Winelect, uh, if you've been to our website, you've seen that we have kind of two major lines of business. business. We have consulting and instructor-led training. Uh, we're principally a consulting company that does uh, stuff in the Microsoft space. So anything on Microsoft Azure, anything related to software development in the .NET stack, things with Xamarin and things like that. We do a lot of consulting work around that. And then we also do a lot of instructor-led training. We've been a number one trainer for Microsoft for many, many, many years. And we've trained a lot of Microsoft uh, employees and developers, many that required courses on our, um, from our instructors were required courses for Microsoft developers. So we've got we've had a lot of influence over the years in that space. Uh, some of our uh, books were put out by Microsoft Press and, and co-branded with Microsoft, including the course CLR VSC Sharp by Jeffrey Richter. And you've probably seen, if you've ever been a .NET developer, have probably looked at these books before you at some point or another, uh, particularly this this one or Jeff Procise's Windows Programming with MFC or Debugging .NET that app to applications by John Robbins and many, many other books that we have uh, published over the years. Uh, and now that we've kind of gotten out of the, 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 the computer book industry is gone more in favor of other delivery methods. Um, we also have been uh, been doing a lot of work for Microsoft as for and as a Microsoft Gold partner and other things related to that as well. And we have a number of instructors that do teach on Microsoft technologies and we have a number of Microsoft MVPs on staff as well as an RD for the Atlanta area. So I am as I mentioned, Blaze Stewart, I'm a Microsoft Azure MVP as well as a certified Microsoft Azure Solutions Architect. So I love doing anything Azure and particularly open source on Azure. So that's why I'm excited to talk today about Docker files. Now, I don't really have a lot of dog and pony show as it relates to a uh, slide deck to today. I didn't because this is going to be talking about a lot of code, so I didn't really have a lot of slides to deal with. So the extent of my presentation is going to look something like this, where I have a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, and uh, these are what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the tips and tricks that we're going to be doing with Docker files. So we're going to be looking at a lot of code samples and then running those code samples just to see how they work and so on. So the first thing I want to talk about as it relates to Docker files is the uh, using different things with the run command. So if you're familiar with a doc, if you're not familiar with what a Docker file is, um, the Docker file um, is a script that runs inside of a Docker context that's using used for building Docker images that are useful for deploying to uh, Docker runtimes. Now, I'm not going to sit here and give you a primer on Docker or anything like that, since uh, if you come to this webinar, I kind of have the expectation that you kind of already know what a Docker file is and how to use it. Uh, so we're really going to focus in on some things that you can do to improve those Docker files. And uh, the Docker file that I want to look at for this is to show you how that you can make your Docker files actually more efficient in terms of builds uh, whenever you have them. So one thing that I find uh, common to a lot of different Docker uh, files is something that looks like this. Let me pull this up over here. And where I have runs in a Docker file. Now, a common th thing that folks do in Docker files is they will have a Docker file that looks something like this. So this is a fairly, I say complex, I've seen much longer Docker files than this, uh, but this one has a lot of run commands in it. So what happens when you run this Docker file is you have a Docker file that gets run inside of Docker. And then with each one of these, various commands here, not env, but if you have a copy command or a run command, it actually creates a new layer in the Docker image uh, that gets 
added to the layered file system in Docker. And so with every new command, what ends up happening is Docker will create a new instance of your container based on the previous layer, and then it will create a new layer on the file system, and then create a new image, temporary image, and then I'll run the command, then it'll shut the container down, and then it will then continue that process as you go through the builds process. So if you have a lot of run commands like this particular image does, it will build the image and it will work. Uh, there's nothing that will prevent you from doing this. And this is fine for um, if you just had a single command or maybe two commands, but what ends up happening over time is you end up getting a Docker file, a Docker image that has a lot of layers in, into, in it unnecessarily, which can um, D, uh, which can impact the amount of time it takes to download an image, a pull of an image, or push an image, or even build that image. So the better thing to do is something that looks like this file here, I called it Docker file write, and that's to combine run commands so that you have them more like a script. And the way you do that is if you look at this, this Docker file here, in this Docker file here, they're functionally equivalent to one another. And the only thing I did is instead of having a run command for each line that I want to run, you can then you can chain them together using ampersand ampersand and backslash. And this this you know this will tell the Docker environment the Docker runtime that I want to run all of these commands in this order. But first, I'm going to run this command and then this command and and this command. Now the backslash in a Docker file is a line break. So this allow, I don't have to put a line break in here. I could actually just have one line with all these commands on here. Just for readability though, I'm telling Docker that I, this is a line break and I want it to ampersand this to the next line here. So instead of having a bunch of run commands like we see right here and uh, right, right here where I have them all running down this column, I now just have a single run command that will then run this backslash backslash that will run these all in order. So what does this look like if I actually run this command? So I'm going to run the um, the first Docker file. Let me pull my uh, command prompt up over here. Um, I'm going to run my first one here um, and uh, CD runs and uh, not LSDR. And I'm going to run the one that is improper first. Uh, this should build pretty fast. So if I do Docker build and then I do a dash T and then say runs, and then I say dot, this will, I'm, what I'm telling it to do is tag this image called runs, and then I'm giving it to use the Docker file in this. That actually ran really fast because I've already actually run this image, but notice each of the steps here, that's because I have all of those different run commands in here. Um, each one of these steps is creating a new uh, layer in my image. But if I rename my other file, if I say um, MV Docker file, dash right or docker file um let's go docker file wrong or what's the rename and then i do rename docker file right like this docker file to rename the file i can then run the same build command uh, and it will actually uh, run that as a single step right here so instead of running each one of those layers individually, it's running the, all those commands as a sequence of commands. And so it's doing some app dot get updates and it's doing a lot of scripting in the background. And once that runs, I will then only have a nine steps instead of the 24, 25 that I had in the other file here. So if I have Docker file like this one right here, uh, this one has about nine layer. This one will result in a Docker file with three or four layers coming from Ubuntu 16.04, while the other one, the Docker file wrong one, will come with the uh, the Docker file that will look like this one right here, which is each one of these layer, each one of these run commands representing a new layer of my image and a slower build process for that matter. So with this command here, the, the point of this is to look for ways that you can combine commands using run uh, instead of uh, having separate lines for them and make sure Docker file is a lot more efficient in terms of build size and push and pulls and all of those kind of things because you have a fewer layers in the Docker images once you do that. So let's go on to the second tip, which uh, let's look at this one. I'm, I'm going to run this one first. Uh, let's, we'll come back to it and uh, I'll 
we'll be able to demo this one in a minute because uh, I want to use this one for my next demo, this build actually. Um, and the second, the, the second tip I want to talk about is this one right here, which is to use common base images. Now, when I'm talking about common base images, what I'm talking about here is using common base images among different Docker images. So whenever I build a Docker file, a common base image for building a Docker file is going to allows me to share different layers of a Docker image among a set of images that are derived from them. So what this allows me to do is have a single Docker file. Maybe it's something that looks like the one I just looked at. Now this one, I can build this single dot, this Docker file right here. And this Docker file, will be written as an image and it's it's what I want to base several other images off of. So instead of having this Docker file have a command right here, so the difference between the one I just ran and the 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 one I'm looking at now is this this one right here, um, where is that image? Where's that Docker file? Um, the one I just looked at for my run command, it has a copy command uh, right here and that copy command is copying something from my file system into my base image uh, into my image now for this to work i don't have to have this particular um, image built um, uh, with this already in it i can actually have the everything else run and then do that command last and then with the shared base image i can then have a couple of images that are built from it that look something like this, where I base it from a shared image and I simply run a command that that it varies between each of the derived images from it. So to show you what this actually looks like, I have another Docker file here that's in game two that is called you know, Commander Keen. So I'm going to pull up Commander Keen in a minute as soon as my other image builds. And I can use this one as the base. I can use the shared image to build uh, both games that I want to build, Commander Keen or Prince of Persia. So let's go and check my build here. Uh, everything built. So I can then change this one to use this um, image that I just built, runs, and I can use that for Commander Keen. And I'm going to use that, that base image to share between two different games. So let's go ahead and build this image right here. And this is going to be in this folder here. So I have uh, base image one, game one, and I'm going to build that image first. So let's go to this folder inside of my command prompt here. And this I'm going to do um, Docker build. And you can see I have a commander keen folder in there. So Docker build um, dash T keen, and I'm going to use dot here. And it's really just using that build context uh, from that I use from not from shared any of the uh, from shared or from runs because I actually built this image already. Let me edit this to use uh, runs instead of shared there from from runs and um, and it only added a new layer to it um, by adding in that directory at this mount point here. So if I do a run on this. Um, I should be able to use Docker run and let me get the port number for this that I, so I can demo it to you. Let's go back to my base image here. And, um, uh, where is that guy? I've got too many images open and here's my shared image. Let's open this guy up and it's being exposed on port 80. So that's the port I need to map. So if I go Docker run, run, uh, let's go. I called this one Keen. Uh, I'm going to do dash P. That's to put to a port forward to port 80. And I'm going to go Keen. And uh, that should run um, Commander Keen. And I should be able to pull that up in a browser now. So let's go over here, open a new browser window up. And uh, this should have Commander Keen in it. So if I go uh, HTTP colon slash slash uh, 255. Um, dot 128 slash 8080 and then launch VNC. This is connected to that image now. And uh, I think I have PDWD 123 for the password. And there, um, let's go CD, let's go C colon. That's my C drive for this. And there is that Commander Keen image I built 
uh, mounted. And if I do the IR, I can do install and install a game on this. Um, and this will actually have the, the Commander Keen image uh, built into it. And uh, I can then run Keen 1 and load the game. Now, if I wanted to do something similar with my other image, um, let's get out of this one, dot, dot, slash game 1, uh, game 2. This one has got another fi Docker file in it called Docker file. And it's going to learn, it's going to load up Prince of Persia in the same image. So I can share that base image with game 2 here. So let's go ahead and edit this one. Um, I'm going to call it runs, save it, and then I'm going to build my Prince of Persia image from this folder right here. So let's come back over here and do a Docker build um, on, I'm going to call it uh, Prince of Persia, or just Prince. And let's go ahead and run this guy using port 8081, 8081, and call it Prince. And that one's launched now, and I should be able to launch another. There's my Commander Keen image up and running. So let's go ahead and launch this one. Um, let's just grab that and then change the port number. And um, now I have two instances of the two containers running. Let's see if I can get the password right. PWD123, since that's super secure. Let's go C colon, AIR. Um, and I should have. Uh, Prince, uh, what's the dir star.exe Prince? Yeah, and this is loading now Prince of Persia, uh, th but they're using the exact same base image under the hood. So one of them, uh, I loaded up Commander Keen, and that's this one right here. I copied Commander Keen into that folder, and this one I copied Prince of Persia into that folder. And these are old DOS games I played as a kid uh, that I, I loved, and I built a Docker image to play them online. So with this kind of... Um, sharing of base images. If you have an application that's running a common stack, say you have a .NET core application uh, and you have some specialty, some common libraries that you have that you want to share among all your applications, a, you could first build a .NET core image that has those special libraries and then you can then use that same base image to uh, build all of your derived images from that as well. So you can share a base image among multiple different applications if they share a common runtime and common libraries and things like that. And it saves on disk space as well as load times and other types of things that would penalize you if you built all of those images separately uh, as well. So you can improve your build times, you can improve your disk usage, you can improve your Docker efficiency by having a common base image that all of your derived images use, just like in the case of these two DOS games that are using the exact same base image, but I just built, I just have two applications that are running on the same stack in those different images. So that's one way to handle all of this uh, if you uh, want to do that. So on to uh, demo let's go talk about the third one here that is the um use docker ignore files now this is this is not so much a um a something that you should do to not so much improve docker files as it does as much as it does to improve your docker build efficiencies especially if you're using platforms like node.js and the reason why is Node.js and similar uh, environments don't compile their code into a common uh, executable like you would like .NET CLR compiles to CLR, then the runtime will actually run that code in the executable that is running uh, on whatever operating system you're going. So the, the, the actual runtime has all the operating system level abstractions, but the compiled code would run, if you compiled it on Windows, it'll work on Linux. If you compile it on Linux, it'll work on Windows and something like that. But Node.js doesn't do that. It actually compiles all of the reference libraries in the node modules folder uh, for the, the platform. And then the JavaScript engine doesn't really um, modify those libraries per se, unless they're written in JavaScript, of course, for the particular platform. So you have to really build out those different contexts using a different uh, different operating system. So if I wanted to run my Node.js application on Windows or Linux, I have to re-import the modules for each platform. And um, so when we talk about a Docker ignore file, what we want to do is have that 
Docker ignore file exclude files, sort of like what a git ignore file does. Actually, I think it uses the exact same syntax. And what this will prevent, uh, this, what, this, what, this, what this will do is prevent Docker from uploading a all the files in the Docker um, in, the, in your folder to the Docker context, to the build context. So especially if you're using like Node.js and you have you know, 70 or 80 megabytes of dependencies, you don't want to upload those to your Docker build context every time you call Docker build, because that can really get uh, slow, especially if you have a lot of dependencies. So you can say ignore node modules, and then as part of your build process, you can then tell it to use uh, Docker ignore, and it will ignore uh, the node modules, and then you can re-import those modules at build build time for the specific platform. So to demo this, I'm going to run this little Node.js application here on Windows, and I'm going to then run it in a Docker uh, container with the Docker uh, ignore uh, so that I can run it in both contexts. But I'm going to use the Docker ignore to simply not upload my node modules folder here uh, to that particular build context. And it makes my builds a lot faster that way. So. With this in mind, um, I have this simple Node.js application here. Let's go pull this up inside of my uh, command prompt. Um, let's go cd that, and uh, there's my folder. So if I do a node index.js, this is a very simple Node.js application um, that will basically tell me something about the computer. So if I pull my browser back up, I can go um, I can go uh, http colon slash slash localhost. Um, and this will tell me information about my machine. So I'm running you know, Windows 10 uh, on an x86 platform. Uh, so, yeah, and that's the name of my machine, desktop. That's the, gener the Microsoft generated uh, name for my computer. So this is running on Windows and that's using node modules for Windows in this particular context. So to build this for Docker, I can come back over here. I'm gonna shut this down and um, do Docker uh, build, and I called this particular demo, uh, I'm going to call this tag it with ignore, and use the local build file. Now that built really quickly because I have a cached image, but it ignored the actual upload of the file, uh, the node modules here, because I, dem I don't need those in this context. In fact, if you let's go look at my Docker file, I'll show you where it actually build injects those uh, node modules as part of the, the build process. And that is done on this, this command right here, uh, npm uh, install-p, that's going to read this package.json file and then install the node modules. And then what this is doing is actually doing some cleanup here of Node.js. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then actually setting the command to run node index.js. So um, let's run this on the in the Docker context. And um, I call that ignore. So I should be able to do Docker run. Let's do dash p to get into the port. Um, let's do 80. 82 and map that to port 80 and then I'm going to call docker the, the, the ignore image and then that's going to run on port 80 on my my VM that's running my docker instance here which is a Linux um, VM so if I go HTTP um, not s um, and then go slash slash um, 192 dot I can just grab it from here and edit this I mean, a, lot of, a little easier in trying to remember all these stuff that I typed in, 82. And now I look, I'm running on a Linux host, x86 uh, platform, and that's the kernel version there, 4.15. Uh, that's the x86, x64 architecture Linux platform. So this is actually running in the Docker container now. Same program, different modules. So in this case, I'm using Docker ignore not to upload all of those particular files into my uh, build context. So it makes uploading files a lot faster. Now on a local th context, that's probably not going to be a big a deal if I especially like in my case where I'm running a virtual machine on my local desktop, wherein I have a uh, Docker virtual, I have Docker running on a virtual Linux virtual machine on the same Windows host. But if I was running this, say, in Azure, where I was running to do builds on Azure, and I and I was 
doing all of my builds up in the cloud and I was going to be pushing all of that, all those dot node modules every time I called a build, well, 80 megabytes every time I call that across the wire can get a little bit heavy. It would, if I could just ignore that and get those for my uh, context, my Linux context every time I build it rather than upload my Windows context, which is completely useless, then it will make my build process a lot faster. So Docker, Docker, build, Docker ignores your friend just like get ignores your friend in the get context so you can improve your build times by doing that so let's go ahead and look at the next one um, which is uh, in our list here uh, which is clean up after yourself now when I say clean up after yourself, this is something I often see in Docker files where folks will in, use an apt-get app get or a yum or they'll use APK, whatever distro you're using. They'll install a bunch of stuff and do stuff with that and then never uninstall what they don't need. And the reason you want to do this is A, for security, uh, and B, make your Docker files, uh, make your Docker images smaller. So in a Docker file, the what you want to do is once you get to the point where your your code is you have your dependencies installed everything is there to make your application run any any additional scaffolding that you install to 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 provision your environment that you no longer need you need to get rid of it and the reason you do that is like i said security reasons you don't want the package manager there that can uh, so that can be invoked easily uh, to install rogue packages or something like that into your environment. And second, make your it also make your packages, uh, your build images a lot smaller because you're getting rid of unnecessary components at that point. So to, to show you how, I'm, again, I'm going to use Node.js uh, as an example here because I think Node is one of those uh, offenders that does this often. And that's because Node the node runtime, Node.js runtime, uses an external package manager called npm. And once npm is done installing packages for my Docker image, I don't need it in my Docker image anymore. I can discard the actual npm uh, package manager and just run my application. So let's take a look at this particular uh, cleanup build here. So here again, I have a Docker file that it's going to look a lot like the one we just saw. And uh, it's the exact same application. And this is, in fact, it's pretty much the same build file I just had for the uh, last demo I had. Um, so to walk you through what this is doing is it's copying in the package.json. In fact, I could actually improve this a little bit um, uh, by doing this right here. I can do a um, rm package.json, so I don't even need that anymore uh, by, by removing the package.json because I'm uninstalling the, um, uh, npm as well because package.json is used for uh, by npm and so what i'm doing here in this is i'm copying up the uh, package.json i'm running apk on alpine alpine is a very minimalist image that you can use for building any number of things it doesn't have a lot of extras added to it so it's a very very slim image um, and then i'm calling um, add in some packages from APK. So APK is the Alpine package manager. And I'm adding uh, Node.js here. That's the Node.js runtime. And then here I'm doing Node.js NPM, which is the NPM package manager. And then I'm calling NPM package install dash P here to install the packages that are are defined in this package.json file here. And then I'm calling APK again um, to remove the package manager. And then I'm calling uh, remove here to remove package.json. So all I'm left with here is the node, the node uh, modules folder. And then what this does is it will actually copy up the derivative, the, the remainder of the application into, uh, into the image. And then I should be able to execute this image without having NPM in the way or having the package.json. So it trims a little bit of overhead off of what's installed into the, the image simply by doing the, this little this little bit of cleanup right here. And again, notice that I'm, I'm combining these commands in a single in a single run command. And so that all of this, all these operations happen on the same uh, layer inside my layered file system as well. So this will actually make my layer a lot thinner without and, and I'm not excessively creating unnecessary layers at the same time. So kind of going back to the first point that we made when we talked about the run commands. So with that, let's go ahead and run this and I will end up with a working app without the need without a node.js uh, installed. So let's go ahead and grab this folder here 
and then come back to my um, environment here. Um, and let's go ahead and do a Docker build um, dash T. And uh, this one's called cleanup. And I'm going to go build the image here. And this is going to uh, install a couple of uh, APK files as we're looking at now um, at 64 megabytes. It's adding some stuff in from uh, Node. And then it's calling removing the, uh, it's move, removing some uh, NPM right here. And it's it removed that package.json file. And so now all I have left is my index.json and my Node modules, but no NPM and no package.json installed. And so I can then run Docker run again and do a dash P. I can do 8083 against this guy. And I'm gonna map that to port 80 since I think that's the port I was using. And then I'm gonna call it cleanup after myself. And that is now running on that port. So let's go pull that up in a browser just to show you that it works. It's going to pretty much look like the same as this. Um, and that's going to have a, you know, another hello from, you know, you know running Node.js, but this time I don't have the package manager installed and I don't have the package JSON installed, slimmer image uh, using some cleanup scripts. So this is uh, very useful for, again, uh, uh, making your images smaller. And so you can definitely improve your Docker files by having some cleanup code after you've done all of the provisioning of the image, everything's ready to go and you no longer need the package manager, whatever it might be. Um, I've seen some even go as far as removing something like apt or APK from the image because they no longer need those uh, as part of the image. And you can get really draconian about how much you want to remove from the image to make it as small and compact as you can. Uh, there's actually better ways to do that. And that's what I'm going to talk about next using multi-stage builds. Um, but again, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do this but cleaning up after yourself is one good way to improve the efficiency of your images and the size of your images so let's go uh, look at our next one which is uh, i think we're going to be talking about notepad not notepad plus uh, plus let me pull up notepad here again and uh, this one right here and use multi-stage builds now a multi-stage build in docker uh, is allows you to have essentially what we might call two Docker files in a single Docker file. Uh, it, it basically looks like you have two two different Docker files embedded in the same file, but what it does is it actually executes a build in one Docker uh, in one set of commands, and then you can reference that that the, a previous build in another section of your document. So let's take a look at one of these just to show you what I'm talking about. And I'll, we'll talk about some of the advantages of doing this as well. Um, and Docker multi-stage builds are, uh, I'd say, they, they weren't introduced from, they, they've been around for a couple of years now, maybe about two years, but uh, they, they have a lot of uses for, for helping do similar things like what you would do with cleanup code. Um, and um, I'm again going to pick on Node.js here because I think Node.js really does have, lend itself well to this example. So, and this is a, this is a multi-stage build here uh, where I have two stages. One of them is this one right here. And this stage right here, basically all it does is it copies, it's, it's driving it from Alpine. It's taking this um, command here, uh, this, sorry, this copy here, copy command, and it's then running uh, run apk add npm on this one. And then that's going to install npm, just the package manager. And then it's going to call npm install to install all the node bound modules from this. And then the second stage of this multi-stage build is a, another one derived from Alpine. And instead of adding a new layer to this, instead of what I'm doing is I'm just starting over with a fresh Alpine image and I'm copying from my previous build some files. Basically, I'm doing is saying from zero equals that references its zero based index for the first build that I did up here. Uh, I'm going to copy a folder from this node modules to my new destination node module. So basically it's just moving all the node modules from this build up here into this one down here. And because that already has all of my modules uh, in it, uh, I don't need to run NPM in this new image. All I need to do then is um, 
install my application and install the road and, and install the node runtime. And so this will actually result in a smaller image than the previous example I had where I had cleanup code uh, in it that was removing the, the node.js npm uh, as well as um, removing the package.json. This one is smaller because it's actually got fewer layers in it. Um, and this this is advantageous for that region for that reason and so this one again is calling run the apk that uh, against um, this right here uh node.js and then it's copying the index.js file up and then it's going to expose port 80 and then you know run the command and so this one is using a multi-stage build now what this is actually useful for is an example like I just did here, where I have uh, a provisioning step in my multi a provisioning stage in my in my build, which is the first stage, and then I have a second stage, which is more of a install my application against that provisioning stage, uh, or I can use it for dev test pipelines. Now, what I can do is have a multi-stage build where I have a provisioning stage such as this. And then as part of that build pipeline, I can actually insert a second stage where I take some of the build artifacts from up here and then call some tests in that second stage. And then if that if that build fails because the tests fail, it won't go on to the third stage, which would be the, the final stage, which would be to install the application in a run environment. So I've seen multi-stage builds used for actual test scenarios such as that. It actually uses the build, the build process for the multi-stage build as a way to do unit tests or, or, or things like that in uh, using multi-stage builds as well. That's one DevOps approach to doing uh, testing using Docker uh, for that purpose. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but it's it's a way uh, that you can incorporate testing into a build file on Docker. And there's, a, of course, uh, a, the ability to actually build code in a container where you, you have, you install all of the build stuff into a container like all your build tools, all your uh, all your libraries that are dependencies for the build operations and all that to head on, build the code, and then take the output from the build process and then provision an image as a second stage, and, and then take a final image that takes the the build output and the provisioned output into a third and final image, which takes the build output and the provisioning output into a final image that has neither the, the package manager or the build tools in it, and then outputs a final production-oriented uh, image for actually building a application that is ready for production without package managers, without build tools and all that kind of stuff in it. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with multi-stage builds. And if you're doing something with Docker, I would highly encourage you to see if you can incorporate multi-stage builds to improve your efficiency. But to run this one, let's go ahead and open it up and uh, run it against my multi-stage build to kind of see what it looks like in a build. So let's go CD to that folder and let's go to D DIR. And there it is. Let's go ahead and build this guy. Let's call it uh, multi, just to keep it short. And and it's uh, building it really, really fast here. And it has nine stages here, but the uh, stage four starts the new, the new from. So that's where I pick up a new image and then I add in a couple of layers to that and then I'm ready to, ready to go. This actually ran really, really fast because it's cached. Uh, I didn't do a no cache on this, but, uh, you can see here it's running that copy command and then it's doing the, the provisioning of that. It's copying it up and, and then exposing the port and then finally setting the CMD here. So if I do a, a Docker run here, I can do the same exact thing that I did before. In fact, I could probably just modify that Docker run command um, to use port 84, 8084, and then I call it, call it multi. And we end up with the pretty much the same thing that we saw a second ago here with this application. And this one, it's again, it just again, report back information about the, um, the actual con environment that I'm running in. Now for, the, the final tip that I want to look at uh, for uh, the Notepad++ here, uh, the, the final tip that I want to look at is using a script 
a start script. Now, a start script is is an interest is a way to delegate responsibility out of your Docker file. So, rather than trying to do everything in your Docker file, sometimes it's good to delegate responsibility uh, to whenever a container actually starts up. And the reason that you might want to do this is to be able to, in a, in a way, make your containers more generic, so that you can provision an application and then uh, then uh, provision the application um, with your Docker build and then be able to deploy that application in multiple environments. Uh, but you will want that start script to be able to read some kind of configuration that's injected when you actually run the image, not when you build the image. And that configuration will happen whenever that Docker file runs. Uh, when that Docker container runs for the first time uh, after it's been built. And uh, to, to show you what this looks like, to show you an example of when you might want to do that is a common scenario is when you have things like um, config files that you need to write at start time. So, um, so here's an example of an application that uses a start script. Um, I, I modified this uh, that, that in Node.js application we've been looking for to to read a file out of a, a directory. And so basically it's doing is it's reading here. So what that does is it actually reads a, read some data out of this. So this would be similar to if you're doing something, uh, reading something out of a config file, say Nginx or Apache or some other, H, uh, some other web server that has a uh, config file that you need to configure before that actually runs. So rather than actually inject a config file into that, I can uh, pass parameters into this using environment variables or something like that and actually write the config file whenever the the actual container starts uh, and rather than trying to inject all of that code uh, as part of a build process. So this file is reading this name.txt. So what I want to do then is as part of this uh, build process is I have this start script here that basically is going to look for a file called name.txt whenever I start my image up. So whenever I start my image as a container. And so it's basically going to say, is the, it, does that file exist? If not, take the environment variable name here and write it to that file. And now that file is written in. So my node, my node app can actually read that, uh, that name.txt file. And then that's my so pseudo config file now. And so that might be an example of where I actually write a config file based on environment variables that I injected into my, uh, my build, I'm sorry, into my run when I actually execute this. So my Docker file then is going to look like this right here. Uh, I have my Docker file that that's doing some, um, uh, my, my Docker file is doing some, uh, removal of the package.json is basically what we've seen already. The basically what I'm doing though here is instead of I'm installing bash because I wrote a bash script and I'm changing the entry point to bash instead of the default, uh, you know, slash bin slash sh, I'm changing to slash bin slash bash. And then I'm saying command, I'm saying you start that sh instead of, uh, instead of using a standard shell script, I'm using a bash script here. Uh, but otherwise this will work as is right here. And then, um, when I run this, I don't have any environment variable set inside of my Docker file. So I can just build this and I can actually inject any environment variable into that, that will actually configure my application using environment variables at the runtime. So this actually delegates some of that responsibility that I might otherwise use in a build file to the start script. So let's go ahead and run this to kind of see what this looks like inside of my, um, Docker file here. Um, my Docker build here. So let's go ahead and kill this one, cd backslash to this directory, Docker build, and let's call, let's call this one start and uh, build this, this local one. It's already built, so that built real quickly. I have a cache copy of that. Uh, let's go ahead and run it uh, on port 85. Now, what I'm gonna do here though, is um, uh, let's go ahead and modify this one here, but I'm going to add a, another parameter to this, a dash E parameter, and that allows me to set a, an environment variable. And I'm going to set my name to blaze, and I'm going to change this one to um, what I called start, 
So this basically is telling it to inject an environment in the variable name equals blaze and at start. And this should write the name.txt file um, to that folder, uh, I'm sorry, to the root of that directory. And then it will uh, read that file once I call the start script. And now I'm running on port 80. Um, and let's go ahead and pull this up. And I should see that it should say, tell me that hello from um, I put that on port 85. Uh, it should it should t give me some information about hello blaze, like I just said here. Now to show you that this isn't smoke and mirrors, uh, I'm going to change the name and run this on port 86 uh, and change it to some other name. Uh, let's go to, I'll use my daughter's name, Ember, since that's derivative of blaze. Um, and that same container, everything else is the same. I've changed the port number to port 86. And so I can run this on 86 and there's now Ember right there. So that's using a start script to actually in, uh, configure a application based on environmental variables that get injected into the container. And you can delegate other things to that start script. One common use case is seeding databases, for instance. Um, you can have a start script actually seed the database when the container starts the first time rather than trying to do that at build. Uh, sometimes a common practice with uh, databases running in containers is to have a sh a persistent storage where the database is external to the container, the, the per database persistence is external to the container, it's a, a mounted volume inside of the container. And what ends up happening is when that container starts, the container will read a folder looking for uh, some kind of database backups. And the first thing it will do then is see the database from those database backups. And then it will then start the database uh, engine after it's seeded the database uh, from the backups. Uh, then that's a common task. That's one common instance of where you might want to use uh, start scripts instead of trying to do all of that in your Docker file. And so this actually makes your container images smaller uh, whenever you uh, go to put those into your your, your repos, it keeps things out of your repos that shouldn't be there, like database backups uh, and config files and other things like that. You shouldn't put those in repos. Uh, rather, you should be injecting those whenever the container gets built, either by mounted volumes or you actually run a use a start script to configure that or, or something along those lines. So all of that, uh, using start scripts helps make your Docker files ultimately smaller. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's even good to use start scripts to do a lot of that kind of stuff that I was doing instead of doing it all in a massive run file delegate some of that responsibility to my environment here. So I could actually, going back to that example I, we looked at here on the first uh, Docker tips and tricks here, the one where we had that massive run file uh, right here, uh, there's a lot of things in this I could probably do at runtime instead of doing it right here. I could pass those in as, uh, instead of as environment variables here, I could, uh, have a start script that would actually accept those and then configure what needs to be configured down here as part of that start script or whatever. I mean, I could improve this Docker file a lot here just by using a start script. Uh, I mean, I didn't say this was a perfect example, but, um, but the point is I could improve it using a start script here. In fact, I might do that um, just because I, I, I have actually published this on GitHub uh, in one of my GitHub repos. So uh, a lot of things you can do with those start scripts. So um, that's the last tip and trick that I have, I will now go to questions and we can start looking at those. So uh, before we wrap on that, let me pull up my um, uh, my deck here, which you know really doesn't have anything in it. It's just a, a few demo slides. Um, you know, my conclusion slide was my very next one. Um, again, you can follow us on uh, just we're going to do the go into the question Q and A section here. Uh, but before we do that. Uh, just if you have follow-up questions, please free feel, to, feel free to email me at bsteward at winlock.com, or you can uh, ping me on Twitter at uh, the one mule. Uh, that's mine. The one mule is me, and then Winelect and Winelect Now are the Twitter handles for uh, our Twitter feeds for Winelect. You can check us out online at winelect.com and winelectnow.com. Winelect Now is our our training portal uh, that is. Um, it has uh, content for developers and and uh, micro and, and uh, Microsoft. Uh, IT pros out there on things related to Docker and a number, myriad of other topics. 
And you can also check out our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash one like now, where we will be posting this webinar as well as a lot of short, uh, short format videos that we do on a weekly basis where we do our, our weekly vlog related to Azure technologies uh, as well, which we're currently going through a, a series on containers on our weekly vlog. If you want to get more in depth on some of these topics that we have talked about, Azure Kubernetes services, Azure container instances, container registries, uh, and a myriad of other topics that it's an ongoing discussion. So let me pop out the questions here and let, let's see what you guys have. Maybe you don't have any questions. Let's go back and um, we'll start at the beginning and just kind of sort this by time and then we'll go back to the beginning. Um, and let's see what you guys have as far as questions go. So question number one is you talked about running unit tests. Uh, let me sort these by time, not by date. Um, for developers, is there a Docker image for SQL Server Developer Edition for Windows that can be spun up and when I'm doing a testing database? There is a, I don't know that there's a Developer Edition of SQL Server 19, but there is a, uh, a free version of SQL Server that you could probably do something similar to that, um, that I would, uh, if you're interested in doing that. I think there's a free version of SQL Server that's very minimal, which would probably suffice for a lot of, uh, of doing things like dev test workloads and so, uh, and so on. Uh, someone is teasing me about um, using VS Code and Notepad++. Um, uh, next, how can we get a recording of this webinar? Again, we'll post this on our YouTube channel. Next question here, as I've seen multi-stage builds that we separate copy and package requirements and files, do uh, installs and copies rest, uh, sorry, let me reread this question here. I have seen, um, I have seen it in multiple, mul I have seen it in multiple files that we, we separate, uh, separately copy packages and requirement files and do the install and then the rest of the copy into the project. Why is this so? Uh, that adds an extra layer. Does it right? Um, why is that so? Um, I have seen that too before. Um, and part of the reason why is some people will copy up a file that, uh, why do they do that? I I'm not 100% sure why they do that. I honestly have never really delved into the details of why they do that. My guess would be that it has to do with uh, maybe that there's something um, about the uh, config file, like the package.json gets copied first, you install npm, that's going to run a bunch of scripts. And if you have something that's already existing and that you don't want it to overwrite, or you have something that's a configuration that you don't want it to overwrite that you bring in later, that might be the best way to do that. I, I've seen that. Um, uh, I've seen that. I've seen that practice a lot, and uh, it does add an extra layer. It's a very thin layer. Um, I personally, I would. Uh, I've done it both ways in the past, where you copy the install up. In fact, I've gone to using multi-stage builds now, to where I copy it and then copy the actual provisioned state of the application uh, into a second stage, and don't really do that uh, as as well. Um, in multi-stage builds for doing some, some some similar things. So that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure why folks do it, but I think it probably has to do with something that with with something being in the build itself that that ends up getting that ends up overriding something that the actual npm install would do or something along those lines. Um, hey, is it? it is it good to second next question? Is it good to have hard coded user IDs and passwords? No, I I, I had that in my uh, my my example there. That's because I was doing that as a example. I wouldn't do that in a production file. So no, don't do that. Uh, that's a bad practice. Um, it, it's not secure. Don't do it. Um, uh, next question is. Um, you talked about running unit tests as part of a Docker process build. Is there a way that you can get the results of these in a CI CD pipeline? Yes, you can. Uh, if you look for, um, there's a couple of things, there's a couple ways to do that. Um, one is to use exit codes. Uh, exit codes are what, what Docker build will do is uh, a successful Docker build will have an exit code of zero. And that's what you want. 
uh, for any build in Docker. So if if a build process fails and it, and it might build, it usually will throw an exception or an error code that you can then echo back out uh, to your CI CD pipelines. And if you see a non-zero code, that would be the indication that the, the that the build failed or the test failed in your Docker your Docker build stage, uh, whatever it might be. So that is how you would do it. So if that's the case, then what you want to do then is as part of your CI CD pipelines is grab the logs and uh, that the Docker build process uh, puts out and you can get those and then look at the log files and see what happened. So it, it's Docker builds are very verbose. It spits out everything from the standard errors, everything from standard in, and, and then you can grab that, see what happened, and then make that as part of your uh, look as uh, parse that as part of your 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 uh, follow up to why the Docker build uh, failed or why the test failed or whatever it might be in your CI CD pipeline. So that is, it's the exit codes is how you would go about figuring out the differences between a a, a successful build and a, uh, a a fail build or a successful test or a failed test. And that and and most of the build tools and test tools will exit on something other than zero if the build fails or if the test fails. I know that's true of .NET and of Node.js, and I'm pretty sure that Java would do that or, or any other uh, framework as well. So something that look uh, would uh, would work. Any particular book recommended on the topic? I don't really know of any particular book written on the topic, um, optimizing Docker files or anything like that. Uh, because the, I mean, it'd be just a, the, the, the market for books, it still exists, but the problem with books, especially in Docker and open source, is that open source and Docker change rapidly. So by the time you get a book written, published, uh, and to market, it's usually outdated. And so the rather than look for books, I actually recommend that you, there is a really good uh, article on this, on the, this topic on Docker, on Docker's website, Docker's documentation, Google uh, Docker tips and tricks, Docker file tips and tricks. And you'll probably see a lot of the same kind of things I talk about in this video, webinar. You might see a lot of other blog posts about it as well. And uh, we're going to be talking, we'll be talking, uh, and they're going to be saying probably a lot of the same kinds of things I've just mentioned here. Use cleanups, use multi-stage builds, use Docker ignore. There's a lot of other things I could have talked about, but for the sake of time, I just, I didn't go into a, some, a, some of the more minutia of those. But uh, I think the big rocks are the run command, uh, the the multi-stage builds, and um, using the cleanup code as as th those are kind of the three big rocks that I would uh, recommend that you look at, um, and then you know, using some other things like. Um, uh, base images is a big deal. I, I, I particularly like I'm a, that's one of my pet peeves, especially when I go into shops and I see that, you know, they're everybody's building new images every time they compile their .NET core code. I'm like, you know, you realize you could share a lot of this because you're all using the same libraries. And so a lot of those kinds of practices as well. So um, that's uh, that's the last question. So if you guys have no more questions, I will give you back four minutes of your time and uh, thank you again for attending this edition of Winter Lock Webinars. We'll surely be posting this uh, webinar soon. Uh, and uh, so if you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out to me um, and uh, we will be putting this uh, video up on YouTube so you can view it in the future uh, for uh, a point of reference. And uh, I'll probably put the code out on GitHub and you can and link it to the video description on YouTube as well. Uh, so we can uh, put it out there. So again, uh, thank you so much for attending and I hope to see you in the future on Winterlock Webinars.